My business is growing. Now what? Financial management skills for the entrepreneur was a live webinar that was originally produced on Thursday, April 21st, 2016. The presenters for this presentation were David Blaine and Michael Hoffner with McConley and Asbury. Enjoy this presentation recap and visit us online at www.macpas.com for more information about our future events and presentations. Tyler, thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Blaine. I'm a partner with McConley and Asbury. With me is partner Michael Hoffner. Michael, why don't you say hello? Afternoon. We appreciate everybody's attendance here today. Uh, we're going to uh, have a nice one-hour discussion on financial management uh, for the entrepreneur. It's just uh, we're going to go through a number of different items and scenarios uh, regarding financial statements for the entrepreneur to kind of keep in mind. The first thing we want to do is we are going to put up here um, some information just to kind of start and look at some things. We're going to say, is this good or bad? Let's look at these results, 2014 versus 2015. So as you can you can see, this organization here looks like it's uh, increasing revenues pretty pretty significantly. Net income though still is is flat to down over the prior over the prior year. Cash can, looks like it's building a little bit. Receivables are building a little bit. Payables are building a little bit. And your long-term debt position, it looks like that's building a little bit, as well as your equity position looks like it's declining a little bit. So the, the question is, what do you think? Do you think that this is uh, a good scenario or a bad scenario for an organization? So if we, if we think about it a little bit, we kind of look at the idea that, okay, revenues are up. And a lot of times organizations are going to look at the revenues and say, well, my revenues are increasing. And also from the, from the perspective that the cash position has increased uh, from one hundred to 150000 The things that we want to focus on, though, as well as just revenue increases and a small cash increases, what ultimately at the end of the day are, are we looking for? Well, we're looking for net income. We're looking for income in the organization. Ultimately, we're looking for free and available cash flow. And from that perspective, income is down. Let's also look at the balance sheet a little bit and look at the idea that our current ratio, which is our ability to pay liabilities and have have operating cash available, that is also deteriorating a little bit. We also have a borrowing position that's increased as well, and we have a negative we have a negative equity position. Yeah, so I think David, you you raise a good point as an introduction here. Um, a lot of times when we've put our heart and soul into uh, starting a business put our heart and soul into growing our baby into something, we, we focus on two real main lines. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go this afternoon. Uh, but we look at we look at revenue and we look at cash. And for both of those measures on this example you've just provided, uh, I would say a lot of folks would look at that and say, not bad. My cash is up. My revenue doubled. Uh, fantastic stuff. But ultimately, the goal of today is to make sure we're not just focusing on those two obvious measures, but thinking through some of the more important trends and measurements that, that an entrepreneur should be looking at and that a business owner should look at as a way to predict their success. It's not just about cash in the bank. Uh, it's how do I predict the cash that's going to be in the bank a year, two years, three years from now. Mike, and hence, that's why we're here. So we're going to go to the next page. The reason why I wanted to start with that is I thought that that would be a, a good indi a good um, leeway into talking about what our topics for the webinar today are going to be. So as Mike was talking about, some of the things that we want to make sure that we don't lose focus as entrepreneurs, as people who are growing a business and trying to run a business, is we there's certain items that we do want to really kind of keep our attention towards that will have long-term ramifications to the organization. And those the items are going to, we're going to talk about today. So, uh, balance sheet management will be one. The other item we're going to talk about is cash flow management. How do we handle our cash and how do we manage cash to make payables and to have excess cash available uh, to do other things within the organization? We're going to look at financial ratios and why those financial ratios are important for helping to determine the direction of the business. And then what we're going to try to do is wrap all three of those items into what what is driving long-term value for the business because ultimately for a lot of entrepreneurs, the their retirement is invested into their business. And we want to look at, through the, looking at cash flow management and balance sheet and, and things of that nature, how does that drive long-term value and how does that protect the value and equity in your business? 
So I'm gonna. So first item we're gonna have is balance sheet manager. I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Mike's gonna talk a little bit about the balance sheet. Yeah, happy to uh, to go into that topic a little bit more. Uh, as as we talked about a moment ago, it's it's easy to focus on a few key highlights that are familiar to us uh, in an organization. Cash, obviously, being one of those. Uh, but the balance sheet is a it tells a story about where the organization stands as of a point in time. And I think we want to spend just the next couple of minutes uh, talking about why that's important, what components of the balance sheet we should be looking at uh, more than just cash. And quite frankly, uh, there are things on that balance sheet sheet that are far more important than just looking at cash. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about how to analyze some of those items. So balance sheet, you may refer to it as a statement of financial position, a statement of assets and liabilities. For those that are not um, from a finance background who may be in our audience today, uh, balance sheet is simply a record of all the assets uh, and the things that you own or are due in your organization. Uh, and a record of all the liabilities or things that you owe in your organization. Uh, and the way those play together tell us a, a pretty significant story uh, about uh, what our business is doing today, what it's been doing over the past year, and what it may do in the future. <clears throat> it's not just about uh, growth. It's not just about the amount of cash sitting in the bank. Um, but there's a lot of other things we need to, to focus on. So why is that, why is that important? Uh, sorry, Tyler, jump ahead of me a little bit there. Um, it's, it's important to understand where we are today, but I, I want to caution um, that the story is not just about where we are today. The story is about uh, where we are today in relation to where we've been and where we may want to be. So we're going to talk for a few minutes about some of those key balance sheet measures, but let's, let's bear in mind um, that the balance sheet's a snapshot in time, and, and it doesn't tell us the story we need to know if we're not looking forward and backwards uh, at what's happened in the past and in the future. So simple example, David, if I told you you that I'm sitting here today weighing 220 pounds, <clears throat> does that mean a lot to you? Well, it depends on what your size is, Mike. I mean, we might have... Well, we're not, it was a little too much detail there, David. Point <laughs> no, no, being, no, point no, being no, if I looked at you... it doesn't tell me anything right now. If I looked yeah. at you and said, David, uh, six months ago I was 235, I'm 220 today, and I'm going to, to 210 in the near future, that tells you a different story than just saying I'm 220 today, right? Yes, absolutely. So our focus here is not just focusing on that metric, what that scale says, but is focusing on where I came from and where I want to get to. And that's what we're going to try and get into a little bit on those balance sheet measures today. So now <clears throat> let's move a little bit into why that's important. Um, there are others that use that balance sheet. Uh, it's not just the business owner. It's not just the entrepreneur who takes a look at, at that snapshot in time. Where are we today? What do I have in my possession as a business right now? Uh, and what do I owe? What do I need to pay out? Uh, that's clearly the most uh, significant and regular user of the financial statements uh, of the balance sheet. Uh, but we have to think about who outside of our walls uh, may be using those the balance sheet now and who may be using it in the future. So obviously banks, uh, if we have a line of credit, if we have uh, a loan against some uh, equipment or assets, um, the bank is going to be looking at the balance sheet and the, the ratios and the metrics that we'll be talking about a little bit later are going to be really key and critical to the bank's understanding of our financial health. Uh, you may uh, have a an insurance agent that wants to get a good understanding of some of your financial metrics and your liquidity. Uh, bonding companies in the construction area certainly have a significant interest uh, in the health of your liquidity, the health of your balance sheet, the ability to pay obligations they come due. Uh, so there's a lot of folks that are, are looking at these metrics and ratios, and if they start to ask questions of you as an entrepreneur, uh, it certainly is helpful to understand the answers to those questions, uh, and more importantly, to be able to give some direction as to what you're working towards if those metrics may not be exactly where you want them. Uh, clearly stockholders, uh, but looking also into the future, potential investors. Uh, it's not just about maximizing the health of the organization today. It's also about thinking where we're going to be and what needs we might have in a year, two years, three years, uh, whether that be to uh, entice an investor to look at our business or to interest a bank in setting up a, a loan package for us. Uh, understanding how those things play together and making sure we're painting a picture uh, of not only fiscal health today, but building to the right thing in the future is certainly something we ought to be thinking about on a regular basis. So Mike, so, yeah, go so ahead, David. just real quick, Mike, just to kind of um, come back on, on, a, on a subject there. When it comes to the balance sheet, 
the reason why the, the the reason why this the balance sheet in in the ass, in the eyes of the, of the banks and the brokers and the, and the credit management companies is so important is because that's giving them the understanding of long term where this business is going and are they going to be able to sustain additional growth sustain additional growth in the future and be able to be able to pay their bills and be able to have the cash flow that they need to have to really run a really run a business the way the business needs to be run. So what, going back to the initial um, analysis, we talked about we talked about revenues and growth and revenues. Clear growth and <coughs> revenues is important, but ultimately at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you have that free and available cash, and that's going to come from good cash, good management of your balance sheet. Good point. Good point, David. Thank you. So how do we manage that balance sheet? How do we think through what we have today and uh, how we need to either clean that up or, or at least be aware of what the, the health of that balance sheet is? First and foremost, uh, reconciliation of your cash accounts. Cash is king. I know we'll talk about that a little bit more, David, uh, as we talk about cash flow management. Uh, but when you look at your balance sheet, obviously uh, your entrepreneur tends to look at what's my cash in the bank uh, and therefore I see what, what's my cash in my general ledger. Um, there is a difference between those two numbers. There's checks that have been written and haven't cleared the bank. There's deposits that haven't made it into the bank account yet that might be in my general ledger. I need to be able to understand uh, exactly where my cash position is and what items are in transit. So monthly reconciliation of cash accounts is absolutely critical to understand the nature of things that uh, maybe aren't clearing the bank as quickly as you expect them to and helping not to lose sight. Uh, many of our clients do daily cash reconciliations. Uh, clients that are heavily cash intensive uh, need to have a better picture uh, on a daily basis. Monthly doesn't really do it. Uh, but in most cases, a monthly cash reconciliation with a good level of precision will get you where you need to be. Um, accounts receivable agings. Uh, when you think about cash as king, uh, you think about how we get cash. We, we provide a service or we deliver a product uh, and we send an invoice. Uh, and eventually that invoice converts to cash. But if I don't have a great understanding and a good oversight of my accounts receivable health, uh, I, lose, uh, I lose sight pretty quickly of the, the health of my cash account, quite frankly. Uh, so I need to understand, do I have accounts receivable that are going stale? Do I have accounts receivable that I may be expecting to convert to cash in the near term uh, to help pay some liabilities, and yet uh, I, maybe I've lost sight of a, a term that I, I put into a, a, an account? Uh, maybe I have a client that uh, is having some tough economic times, and I need to be a little closer to them that uh, than maybe I was before. So understanding what's in your accounts receivable is every bit as critical as understanding what's in your cash, uh, not for today, but really for the cash that you're going to need 30, 60, and 90 days from now. Uh, inventory levels, there's different levels of detail that uh, we would suggest you look at uh, your inventory in. Uh, if, if you work in an organization or you founded an organization that is a low inventory intensive business uh, or it's just a few high dollar items that are kept in inventory, but uh, as an entrepreneur, you could walk out on your floor and you know exactly what's in that warehouse. You know exactly what you're supposed to have. Uh, it's probably less critical to look at inventory uh, on a, a daily or a perpetual basis, uh, to have a really high level system that tracks your inventory uh, with precision that you can print a report out any given day of the week and know exactly what you have in stock. Uh, conversely, if you have a high volume, maybe lower dollar but high volume product that you deliver, uh, if you have a warehouse that stores all of your repairs and, uh, and maintenance materials and those are your lifeblood, uh, and if you run out of a certain widget, you can't perform a service for your customers, uh, and that's a high turnover type item, you probably want to consider a daily inventory system, something that tells you exactly with precision what's there every day. So the difference really between perpetual and physical, as, as noted on the screen, uh, a perpetual inventory system is one that is updated each and every time something is put in and out of inventory, and you do what's, uh, what are referred to as cycle counts. So you actually sample on a daily or weekly basis the items in 
an inventory to make sure that system is still accurate. So perpetual inventory is tested regularly uh, all throughout a month and all throughout a year. So you have a high degree of confidence at any given point in time that that inventory is accurate. A full physical usually done once or twice a year. Uh, you may lose a little precision in your inventory records over the course of that year, uh, but you do a real bang up job on an annual or semi-annual basis, tightening that up and cleaning it up. Uh, so it's different for every organization. I don't think there is a one type of inventory management is correct for everybody, uh, but it is something you really ought to sit back and think about how tightly do I need to control uh, knowing what's in my inventory and can I tell at a moment's notice uh, whether I'm short on something or I have an inventory that might be getting stale and I need to turn over and move quicker? Uh, something that's unique for every organization and but you really need to give some thought to as you look at your balance sheet. Finally, fixed asset management. And the only thing I would say on this particular area for the entrepreneur, we often think about what we have and we know what we have in fixed assets. We know we have, uh, we have our trucks, we have our machinery, we have our equipment. Uh, what we don't often think about because we're in the here and now trying to run a successful business and build a successful business, we don't often think about when those assets will need to be replaced. And so I would encourage uh, as you think about your fixed asset management, don't just think about making sure you have what's in the system today fairly clean, but be thinking and, and actually writing down pen to paper, what am I going to need and what's it going to cost in a year, two years, five years, uh, not just because I'm growing, but simply because I need to replace XYZ machinery. Uh, and David's going to talk a little bit later about uh, capital measures and cash flow management, and that's going to be a critical part that plays into how you predict your capital needs. Liability side, uh, we'll keep this part fairly short. So on the, the vendor side, one thing to bear in mind uh, that most, not all, but, uh, but many vendors will offer prompt payment discounts. Uh, and frankly, if you have cash in the bank, you're leaving maybe 2% on the table by not taking advantage of those prompt payment discounts. So it's really critical that as a, a manager of your business and an owner of your business, uh, that you take the time to understand what your vendors are asking for and more importantly, what they're offering. Uh, a happy vendor is a vendor that will continue to service you uh, quickly and promptly, um, but you want to save the money any anytime you can, and so pay attention to what they're offering. Uh, debt management, um, it's not about, and I, I would just say it this way, and David, you can, you can chime in if you want, but uh, too often we hear uh, in a growing business, an entrepreneur looks at a, a lending relationship and says, can I get better cost of capital? Can I, can I change banks and get something yeah. a little cheaper? Uh, and frankly, there's, there might be another bank out there. There might be another lender out there that's willing to do a little bit better on pricing, a few basis points. Uh, and I think we would encourage you to think long and hard about that kind of a decision. You need to understand uh, the benefits of working with a lender for the long term. And that lender who particularly is an entrepreneur will stand by your side when maybe you have a down year and when maybe you have some concerns. So it's not just about what's on the screen right now and understanding uh, how your debt structured and how your collateral structured, uh, but it's really about building that long-term relationship with a lender so that they're by your side when you do grow to the point where you need more uh, and where you maybe do have a little bit of a down cycle for your business. Uh, so just wanted to, to say that uh, and, and give that thought. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And the, by doing that, we'll help you with doing some things that we, we outline on there, such as structuring your principal and interest payments. You might have a situation where you have some cash flow needs. You need to change the uh, terms of your financing, and they'll be more willing to work with you on the, changing the terms of that financing to allow for the for, for more free and available cash for whatever financing needs you might have in the business. So. Good. Thank you, David. So really what, it, um, what it's about on the balance sheet uh, is not not just looking at a few key line items by themselves, uh, but taking a thoughtful approach to managing what is on your balance sheet, uh, thinking about where you you want those those numbers to be, thinking about uh, the items in your current assets that you need to convert to cash. Uh, it's it's not just about that snapshot and that point in time. 
Uh, but really thinking about what's the what's the best balance sheet position to be in as I want to achieve my objectives as a business owner. We'll talk in a few minutes about some key ratios that uh, are worth looking at, things that we would recommend and suggest that uh, that you take to heart as you go forward in managing your business. Uh, but just wanted to point out a couple of thoughts there on, on balance sheet management before we move on to everybody's favorite topic which is managing the cash flow of your business and often gets a little more of the sizzle than managing that point in time balance sheet. The sizzle, I like that, I like that, Mike. So let's talk a little bit about cash flow management. The reason why we started with the balance sheet to start with is because the how you manage the balance sheet and how you manage activities on the balance sheet is going to have a direct correlation to cash flow management and how you use cash. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the first item I have there is cash is king. I mean, the bottom line is we don't have cash available to run the business. We, we don't have a business. So we're always looking to try to protect our cash position. Again, protecting the cash position really starts with balance with, with the health of the balance sheet. Uh, the other with, with that, we want to have daily focus on cash is critical for all businesses, whether in the startup phase or growth stage of the business. So a good example is this morning I had a meeting with a client and we talked about their cash flow management and where they were with, with their their um with with certain cash items and cash needs of their business. That this organization has been around for quite some time that I met with this morning, but they have a pretty significant focus on a weekly basis as to what is the cash flow position of the organization, what are the future needs of cash for the organization, and they they spend significant amounts of time around the cash flow management. The other thing too is the ability to access and manage cash flow and cash flow needs uh, to help determine long-term operating uh, operating needs of the business and to help protect the business's assets. So by man- again, by managing the cash flow of the business, you can better help to protect long-term needs of the business or assets in the business in regards to whether you need to refinance debt or there's a some type of matter where you need to have additional financing. So let's talk a little bit about some of the tips for managing short-term and long-term cash flow. Um, on a short-term basis, uh, the, the first thing we talked about it, it, on the, when we were talking in the balance sheet is also sort, is also true in cash flow management. And that is, let's review cash collections on a daily basis. And the reason why reviewing cash collections on a daily basis is important is because it, it can do a couple things for you. Number one, you can look at the the paying habits of your customers. Are customers paying early? Um, are you giving customers discounts to pay early? And are they paying within those discount periods? And by looking at those payment habits will help you better manage on a, on a daily, weekly, and even monthly basis what your cash is going to be, whether that cash is going to peak and whether that cash might, val- might valley on you as well. Um, it will also help you with looking at things such as, um, you know, how are they paying? Are they paying by cash, check? They using credit cards to, to pay the to pay the cash, and the reason why I bring this up is, uh, typically not many customers are paying by cash anymore, but by check. I mean, is it is it an EFT coming in, um, or is it a hard check coming in? Is there a way to offer uh, the ability for them to access a quicker payment policy to you, so you can get the cash in quicker? That's why we talk about credit cards. Uh, let's go to accounts receivable aging. The 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 how quickly is your accounts receivable turning over? If you're turning your accounts receivable over in 30 days versus 45 days, um, that 15-day window is pretty significant to your cash flow and your cash flow needs because ultimately at the end of the year, instead of being able to turn over your cash flow 12 times, if you're if people are paying if your customers are paying in 45 days, you're actually only turning your returning turning over your receivables eight times. So what is that impact on your cash? You know, our cash. You also want to look at our customers slow paying. And if they are slow paying, why are they slow paying? Is there something that you can do to help accelerate the payments? Is there a payment plan that might be necess- that you can put in place for them? But looking at why they're slow paying and helping to better identify how you can more quickly get them to get the cash in the door to you. And finally, are incentives being offered to customers to pay more quickly? You know, we th- we talk about 210 net 30 as as discount periods. Although you might be giving a two percent discount, getting the cash in 10 days versus getting it in 30 days, you can turn that cash over three or four times throughout the year, which puts the cash in your pocket and allows you to invest back into the business. So looking at payment terms would be is, is also something that's important for cash flow management. Let's talk about accounts payable a little bit. 
in, in within your organization? Are, are you paying within terms or, or are you taking advantage of the discount periods? The one thing about discount periods is that if it's if you're getting a two percent discount um, on 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 a liability or on a, or on an invoice, if you pay that, it, although you might pay that in ten days versus just letting it go to its term of thirty days, that two percent savings or that one and a half percent savings, when you add that up over a whole year, that has a that has a, a close to an eighteen percent annual return for the organization on that savings because you're picking up that savings every time you make a payment and over a month and, and constantly month over month over month. So that could have significant impacts to your cash flow. Again, you can only make those discount payments if you have the availability of funds to do so. But if you do, you got to look at got to look at weighing the advantages of do I pay within discount or hold the cash and use it for something different. The other thing too is how are you making payments? Are you paying by check? Are you paying by EFT or are you paying by credit card? And the reason why this is important is because when you cut a check, there's clearly cost to cutting a check in regards to the, just the physical cost of the check and also mailing the check. There's also the, there's also the lag time of the time that that check gets cashed. If you pay by EFT, you clearly save the postage, you clearly save the cost of the check, but you don't have the lag time of the cash until it's deposited by somebody else. The other options, too, are credit cards. Now, I know there's a lot of organizations out there now that provide these uh, purchase cards and this per- these purchasing card systems that allow you to earn cash back for the use of the purchase card if you're buying certain capital equipment or fixed assets in nature uh, of some nature. But again, these are all kinds of things that you need to kind of take into consideration as you're looking at your cash flow position and you're looking at how you, how you manage your cash. Uh, these are all little savings items and little savings options, but ultimately, at the end of the day, can have big benefits to you. If we look at longer-term needs, let's talk about capital needs. I mean, do you do, do we need a line of credit to for general business operations, and do we need any types of intermediate-term lending for any types of business assets um, or any business asset needs? Ha- this goes back to what Mike was talking about a little bit earlier on the liability side of the balance sheet and having a good relationship with a bank. But having the ability to work with a bank that can give you the ability to access a line of credit um, to help you grow the business if you need to access some type of a piece of equipment or some type of short-term lending to buy a piece of equipment. Other financing needs too by having a good relationship with your bank would be cap would be equipment purchases if there are large equipment purchases to put on a manufacturing floor or even what about business purchases if you're trying to acquire maybe a smaller business that has uh, a lot of synergies with your business that you can bring into the fold and you can bring this into your organization that will help increase your revenues, help increase your cash flow, and maybe stabilize maybe your debt structure. These are the types of things that you need to look look at long term and how they impact your cash flow. Other things to determine uh, when determining long term cash flow needs. Assessing payback periods. I think we talked a little bit about that. How quickly can the financing be repaid? What are the interest rates on the financing? Is, it, is the financing variable or fixed? Var- variable being, does that, does that interest rate change with uh, the way the markets change? And if it's fixed, what's the terms of the fixed rate? Is it five years? Is it seven years? And how does this impact the monthly cash flow needs of the business? And how does that amortize out monthly for, for your standard payments? One thing to do is uh, be careful not to over leverage the business. And I know this sounds a little cliche, um, but however, you know, most banks are, are right, you know, being in a new economy that we're in, you know, most banks are very cautious of this and they're always looking at making sure the business isn't over leveraged. Hence, the importance of managing your balance sheet and making sure that you have a strong balance sheet that shows that you're not over leveraged and you can make your cash payments. So, but you, you want to be cautious as to being over leveraged because you don't want to be in a situation where you can't access additional capital to make further expansion into your business because you now have a lot of your assets completely tied up and there's no more ability to leverage off of those assets. So let's talk about, you know, we talked about how cash flow management, let's talk about some of the key areas of of how to determine what your cash position is. When looking at your cash position, it's, it's a little bit more than just looking at what's the available cash on my balance sheet. It really has to look, you really have to look at a number of different items. You have to look at 
what is the, the ultimate free and available cash between the cash, the receivables, what are my short-term payables I have to make, and what are the, what are the longer-term payables that, are, that need to be made um, on a weekly or a monthly basis. So three primary areas that a lot of banks and lending institutions look at is EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. They also look at unlevered cash flow, and this is what they consider to be the cash that's free and clear at the end of the day after all taxes and interest are paid on, on loans or any types of federal tax. And then there's operating cash flow from the cash flow statement. And as we think about the cash flow statement, you have operating cash, you have investing and financing. Operating cash is usually the top part of the statement where it looks at the changes in all your different um, balance sheet accounts, whether it's receivables or payables or any types of prepaids. But at the end of the day, that operating cash is the cash that's available to help operate the business. There are three of the areas that a lot of the lending institutions or third parties look at when they try to determine if there's availability of cash. So finally, just to sum up where we're at with cash flow management, um, balance sheet and cash flow management go hand in hand. I think we've talked about this. Good receivable management will improve cash collections while also ensuring there is no negative adjustment to receivables in the balance sheet. You know, taking advantage of payment terms and discounts to help manage payables and, and help with uh, cash flow savings. Daily management of slow pay items, any types of items that, you know, re require a quick, quick response or quick, quick collection. And then long-term planning for equipment and business needs. Financing that will help to manage the balance sheet will provide the cash flow needs to continue to grow the business. With that being said, we're going to now we talked about the uh, balance sheet and cash flow management. We're going to go into ratios, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and we're going to talk about the ratios that are important to kind of manage as you look at your business. <clears throat> Thanks, David. So j before we jump into that, I just want to uh, reiterate that you are free to pose questions. Uh, we can play stump the partner. Anything that you post there, I will kindly read to the head of our ESG practice. Uh, David, and let him try and answer to the best of his knowledge and ability. So feel free to uh, join me in a little game of uh, stump the partner in charge of ESG as we go through the next few minutes here uh, using the chat feature there on your screen. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ratios and what ratios are. We talked about the balance sheet and we talked about cash flow. Uh, and we talked about a lot of, of numbers and things to look at and trends that you might want to look at. Um, each one of those is, is worthwhile in and of itself. Uh, ratios are really the thing that allow us to measure the relationships between the things that we see on our balance sheet. They tell a much greater story than just a raw number. Uh, it's great to say that, <coughs> excuse me, it's great to say that my, my cash went up and my accounts receivable went up and my accounts payable went down a little bit and, uh, and we can see these trend lines in the actual raw numbers on our financial statements. But if you think back to the original discussion we had as we kicked things off, we had an organization that went from 5 million in sales to 10 million of sales from one year to the next. Uh, and you automatically have a very difficult time doing a common size analysis. Am I in a better position on my balance sheet or in my cash flow than I was last year? Uh, but it's hard to say because I'm not apples to apples anymore. I'm, I'm a $5 million company. Now I'm a $10 million company. Or I am a $4 million company and I happen to get financial access through an industry group I'm part of to some financial information from a company that's 18 million or 25 million. How do I compare myself to an organization that's four or five times my size? That's where ratios come in. Ratios allow us to get a common size measurement of how we look at those balance sheet and cash flow items. So we want to look at trends. Uh, we want to look at how things are moving. We want to look at industry data. Uh, all of that is much easier and more favorable to do when we're talking ratios and the, uh, the level of, of measure A as it relates to measure B, much more so than raw dollar amounts. Um, so ratios are going to help us look at profitability. They're going to help us look at liquidity, solvency, efficiency, uh, really uh, a baseline for us to understand whether our business is moving in the right direction. So let's talk about which ratios are the best. David, which ratio is the best? It depends. 
It depends. It It depends. And uh, I know folks love when accountants and tax folks and finance professionals say it depends, but it it really is the right answer in so many cases. Uh, Every organization is different. The drivers of every organization are different. Uh, And so the ratios that you would look at to manage your business are really, uh, really have to be unique to the type of business that you're in. Uh, And you'd need to sit back and, and talk about what all ratios are available. You can measure anything against anything else. That doesn't mean it's going to be a valuable tool in how you manage your business. So we're going to talk about uh, over the next 10 minutes, 5 minutes or so here, some balance sheet ratios. And then we're going to talk about some cash flow measures and liquidity ratios that uh, David will go through. Uh, each one of those things, I would say in advance, uh, are important to think about, may or may not be worthwhile in looking at in your industry. So Let's go ahead and, uh, and jump into some liquidity ratios first. And these, <clears throat> these first two, I would say, uh, if you ask what some of the most common ratios that are considered would be, I would say your, uh, your first two liquidity ratios here should come to the top of the list each and every time. So your current ratio and your quick ratio uh, really are simple ways to determine your ability to pay the upcoming obligations of your organization. So current ratio is your total current assets as it relates to your total current liabilities. Obviously, the higher that ratio is, the more liquid you are. So it's not just about the amount of cash you have in the bank, uh, but current assets are generally defined as assets which will convert to cash Uh, within the next year, within the next 12 months. Current liabilities are obligations that need to be paid within the next 12 months. So when we look at that simple measure, total current assets to total current liabilities gives me a a great idea of whether I will be or should be able to pay my obligations as they come due. And if that number becomes negative or less than one-to-one, uh, it's something certainly to be concerned about uh, because the implication there is I have I do not have enough assets in my business that will convert to cash to pay the obligations that I will need to pay in the next 12 months. Uh, significant decreases uh, are important to consider, but remembering that uh, the balance sheet is a snapshot at a point in time. And if I look at December 31st, 2014 to December 31st, 2015, and my current ratio goes down dramatically, and I've got a big decrease to worry about, um, it may or may not be something to worry about. We need to think about context. We need to think about a potential one-time item that might be sitting in my liabilities or something that is out of my my current assets. Um, we have to look at it in context of what what constitutes those current assets and liabilities. Uh, The important thing is to be looking at it. The important thing is to be measuring the trends uh, on a quarterly basis over a trailing two-year period gives you a great picture of the health of your organization from a uh, a liquidity and an ability to meet obligations perspective. The quick ratio, very similar, almost the same thing, uh, but it's really more of a pure liquidity as opposed to all current assets, which can include some prepaids and current portion of some things do. It's simply the cash in my bank today plus the accounts receivable. And accounts receivable are things that are obviously have already been billed and are expected to convert to cash very soon. I should be getting paid in 30 to 60 days at most. Um, And so that's really a pure liquidity ratio. What is my cash now plus cash I should have very soon as it relates to total current liabilities? The one caveat I would say, uh, and it's it's encapsulated in that second bullet point, is to make sure you take some time to look at the health of your receivables. Uh, It really should be, if we were going to get nitpicky on the slide, it should be cash plus net accounts receivable. So that's net of your allowance for doubtful accounts. There will be some cases where uh, if you want a true liquidity ratio, uh, you really ought to discount those receivables to take credit for or accountability for things that might not get paid. Those vendors that David had mentioned uh, that may or may not, uh, the customers that may or may not be in a position to pay right now. So just uh, two ratios that I think if you're if you're only going to look at two, I'm not saying these are more important than the others, uh, but certainly far and away ones that tell a real simple story about the health of your business. So let's look at uh, some financial leverage. And there's, uh, there's a mile-long list of various financial coverage ratios uh, that are worth considering. I would uh, encourage you, if you have a debt agreement, 
uh, with your bank that has covenants built into it to read specifically what they're asking for, because quite frequently there will be a debt service coverage ratio requirement or a debt to equity ratio requirement. Uh, But I will tell you that it's not always defined the same. And so it's important as we go from client to client, it's important for us not to just see that there is a debt to equity ratio, but to actually consider how they define that. Sometimes debt to equity will actually include your accounts payable because it is a quasi-debt obligation that you owe to a vendor. Sometimes it doesn't. It's only bank debt. Sometimes it includes subordinated debt. Sometimes it doesn't. So make sure you understand uh, the definitions that your stakeholders are using in these ratios. Uh, Debt to equity really says, uh, how well am I doing in terms of financing my business um, through liabilities versus amount of retained equity? So what's my total capitalization? Uh, Obviously, uh, it is better to have more equity in your business than liabilities of your business. Um, But the story, and I'll say it again and again, the story is not just about where we are today. The story is about the trend that's developing. Uh, So I would, uh, just in the interest of time and moving on, I would just uh, advise that you take a good look at those measures, particularly as they relate to debt service coverage. Take a good look at those measures that your bank is considering and make sure you understand those. So with that, uh, let's move on to some profitability ratios, uh, and I'll let David jump into that. Sure, Mike. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the profitability ratios, looking at the income statement. The first two that we're going to, the, the two that we're going to talk about primarily are going to be uh, the gross profit margin and the net profit margin. Really, at the end of the day, these are the two, what I would say on the income statement, are two most important ratios for you to, for all business owners and entrepreneurs to pay attention to. Gross profit margin, what we're trying to say there is we're looking at what are your revenues versus your gross, what what are your gross profit versus your revenues or your sales? And gross profit being your direct expenses to run the business before admin expenses and SG&A and and those types of expenses. What is that percentage? Is that percentage, how is that percentage being managed? Is that percentage a 40% gross profit margin? Is it a 30%? But looking at that, and looking at, at that over a period of time will help with uh, help with giving you a better understanding of where where is my production cost at in regards to producing this product, and how is those production costs eating into any remaining cash flow at the end after all my other traditional administrative expenses. The net profit margin is looking at what is my net income adjusted before taxes against my sales. And that's ultimately at the end of the day. What what is my what was the what was the free cash or the free amount of money that was available at the end after I paid all my expenses? Again, that's why we're in business. We're in business to make net and profit margin. We're here to try to figure out how can we continue to keep increasing that and managing our expense base while increasing our sales base. The other profit ratios that we can talk about are return on equity and return on assets. So return on equity is just simply net income divided by the total equity. Now, what does this indicate? This is this is going to indicate how much profit is being returned to the shareholders. So, if you are an S corporation or an organization that has a, a limited amount of shareholders, ultimately at the end of the day, they're going to want to know what is the return on my investment? How much am I getting on my investment into this organization? And looking at your return on equity is going to give them a little bit of a better understanding of how their investment into the business is performing. The other item is return on assets. That's going to be your net income versus, uh, divided by your total assets. And this is going to indicate the company's ability to use assets to create profit. So how are, how are you utilizing your assets? How are you utilizing these fixed assets? Um, how the, the collection time on your receivables is very important. How you manage your inventory and your inventory levels is very important because ultimately at the end of the day, that's going to give the, the user a better understanding of how are those assets working for the organization and how are they generating that income for the business. Moving on here, let's talk about activity and efficiency ratios. So activity and efficiency ratios are going to look at things such as how quickly do I collect my how how quickly am I collecting my receivables or how quickly are my receivables being paid on average. So the first one uh, accounts receivable days that's going to look at your accounts receivable divided by your sales and you're going to multiply it by the amount of days in the year. 
And what that's trying to tell everybody or show everybody is it's trying to show you the average number of days that lapse between the time a sale and a receipt of payment is made. So in other words, if we make a sale on day one and we're collecting in 26 days, that, that's a pretty good turnaround. Um, however, if we make a sale and it's taken us 90 days to collect, um, that turnaround is, is going to eat into your uh, cash needs of the business because it's going to eat into your operating cash flows and your ability to be able to do other things with the business because you can't turn over your receivables more quickly enough. Accounts payable days, on the other hand, is looking at your payables divided by sales multiplied by the number of days in the year. And this is almost looking at the opposite of what accounts receivable days are. And this is saying how quickly or what is the time between purchase of materials and the amount of time it's taken to pay for the materials. So a lower the amount of days, the quicker the payment to the vendors, obviously. So if you're paying within 15 days or 10 days, um, obviously you're making quick payment. So you might be saying, why would I want to pay so quickly? Why would I want to let it go out to term? Again, going back to our discussions on how you utilize discounts and whether discounts are being offered and whether there's a discounts are important to you would be something that would pay, play in to how you handle your accounts payable days. Finally, there's gross fixed asset turnover. This is going to be your sales divided by your gross fixed assets. And this is going to look at, the, this is going to indicate the, the multiple of annualized sales that each dollar of gross fixed assets is producing. And this is usually used more in organizations that have like some type of heavy intensive use of fixed assets, manufacturing facility that has, um, you know, multi-million dollar pieces of fixed assets on the floor, or even, or even construction companies that have a, a lot of capital equipment that's out in the field, excavation companies, things of that nature that have, have um, you know, graders uh, equ equipment such as that. But being able to look at how those fixed assets are being used and how it's helping to generate sales um, is very important because at the end of the day, that will help you determine whether you, whether you want to finance more equipment if your business is growing or maybe you want to rent the equipment at the, depending on what your business is doing. That's going to help you have better manage your cash flow position, better manage your balance sheet. So, David, before we move on, um, and I appreciate the conversation on ratios, we could talk about that for another half hour easily. Uh, but we do have a question from our audience. Uh, and so this was pretty straightforward. Um, so I want to get it in now because it's relevant to uh, the conversation we just had. The question is simply, how can I obtain information on expected ratios for my industry? Where would I go to find that? That's a good question. So uh, for, I mean, us internally, I mean, we use a product called a uh, Profit Sense, and Profit Sense is a or is a is a um, product that is used where it takes information that is that is um, con that is accumulated from organizations around the uh, around the country in different industries that allows us to um, take that information and look at it and, and make it industry specific using. SIC codes or NAICS codes where we can kind of boil it into those organizations and see what does this organization look like compared to maybe what this profit sense data is showing us. Um, there's also information in the valuation world such as IBIS. Um, this is data that's usually a, that's usually generated um, by industry and by again SIC and NAICS codes that um, look at where that industry has been, where that industry is going, what the forecast is, and it gives a number of different ratios in regards to leverage, liquidity, um, profitability ratios, and what the expectation is in the industry. Yeah, so I, I think um, the summary of that, there's a, there is a ton of information out there. Um, David's information is at the end of the, the slide deck here, and he can help you find it. Right. Yes, that's, that's, that's the short and sweet answer. That's exactly um, right, Mike. That's so, exactly right. Thank you. So, yep, uh, no problem. Go ahead. Um, let's go on to the last item to talk about here, and it's uh, how does long-term value proposition – so the, the question is we've talked about balance sheet management. we talked about cash flow management. we talked about these ratios, and you know, you're probably, a, a lot of people might be saying, well, what does this all mean? You know, I have all this information. Yeah, that, it's going to help me better run my business. But ultimately, w what, what is it really doing for me? Really, at the end of the day, what, what it comes down to is, you know, how, how are we, man by, managing the, by managing those items and activities, how is that impacting the long-term value of the business and 
how is it how is it establishing our business or setting it up for long term for long term growth and long term growth opportunities? So for most so as we think about it, for most entrepreneurs that, or business owners, their retirement's actually in these businesses. I mean, the majority of what they have invested in their life is in these businesses. So being able to, to generate that long term value is important. So, so when we talk about the balance sheet and cash flow, we talk about protecting assets. We talk about continued long-term growth of those assets in the business. So at the ultimately, at the end of the day, your retirement um, continues to keep growing, kind of like an investment in the market. This is just a little bit of a different investment. And so specifically, management of the balance sheet and cash flow-related matters provide for the most long-term value to the business. And let's talk about how that, how that is. So the next slide there talks about long-term business value is primarily generated from two specific areas. So basically what's being looked at is you're looking at positive cash flow generation of the business. And as we talked about earlier, a lot of lending institutions and banks and investors look at things such as EBITDA and unlevered cash flow. Because what that's telling them is that's showing them how much cash is this business throwing off that's free and clear at the end of the day? So as an entrepreneur or a business owner that you're trying to generate long-term value in your business, that's ultimately what you're trying to generate is the ability of the business to generate cash. How does that impact equity? Well, what, what it will do is it will increase your equity position, give you a strong positive equity position on your balance sheet. And through having a strong positive equity position on your balance sheet, that really at the end of the day is where the ultimate value in your business is going to be at is having this equity position that is positive that will grow over time and allow you to continue to grow the business. So when we talk about growing and retained earnings position from positive from positive net income again or positive cash flow, and we talk about also management of shareholder distributions because that will also provide for cash available to shareholders for distributions, which is a return on their equity investment. Long term, uh, next item we're going to talk about is, you know, we talked about this already at the very start. And that is, you know, some people will talk about, you know, well, I'm trying to really heavily increase my revenues. and I need to increase my revenues and generate more revenue. And yes, wow, that's important to the value of the business. And that's important to ultimate cash flow generation of the business. It's not the most important item that you should be focused on. And what you should be focused on is the items we talked about, and that is making sure that we protect our cash flow position, we protect our balance sheet assets, and so we can make sure that we can grow the business into the future. So we're not too heavily invested in in just revenue generation, because if revenues, if you're generating revenues but you're not increasing income, uh, that's ultimately going to be a problem for you. So let's just talk about some val value measurements. Some of the items that uh, that are looked at specifically by by valuation analysts or by banks and other organizations are going to be how you measure value. So there's really three approaches to measuring value. There's the asset approach, and the asset approach is going to be focused on cost and the net value of your assets. And this is usually used in valuations of high high intensive fixed asset businesses and organizations that have a lot of capital equipment or a lot of manufacturing equipment that has some type of net book value that's involved with it. Uh, the second approach is the income approach. Here in the income approach, the, the, the focus is on net cash flow generation. And you're looking to review income and cash flow uh, on an EBITDA or an unlevered cash flow basis. Again, there we're going to look at the sales. You want to look at sales volume, but you also want to look at how your expenses are being managed and also from the expense management side, how that's impacting the balance sheet. And then finally, there's the market approach. And the market approach, what that does is it's going to look at your income approach, such as, you know, what is your what is your cash flow generation? What is your EBITDA or what is your unlevered cash flows? And it's going to then look at comparables in the market. It's going to look at market multiples from other businesses that there, where there might be some information as to what is being paid as a multiple of EBITDA, as a multiple of earnings, as a multiple of, of unlevered cash flow. So in summary, protection of the balance sheet while managing cash flow will increase the value of business in all three of these value approaches. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to go through the conclusion of this. Sure. Webinar. Let's, uh, let's uh, wrap things up here with a, a pretty simple statement. And that simple statement is this. You do not have to have a finance degree to monitor the financial health of your organization. Uh, the things that we've talked about today 
are not things that require a four-year finance degree or an MBA or experience in accounting. Uh, the things we've talked about today are simply reminders uh, to watch your balance sheet, to understand what that balance sheet means, to understand the liquidity ratios that drive your organization. Uh, they're all things that can be done uh, by anybody who's had the, the heart and soul to, to start a business, build a business. Uh, it, the monitoring component of what we've been talking about today is something that uh, really should just be baked into your daily and weekly and monthly activities and doesn't require any special training or education. Uh, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, we encourage you to focus on not just uh, the cash that's in your bank today. We encourage you to focus not just on the revenue and your net income and the amount of taxes you paid. Uh, that tends to be where we default. Uh, but we encourage more of a focus on trend lines in the ratios that are important to your business and really focusing on that big picture of where am I today, where did I come from, and where do I want to be, and then think through with your advisors and your experts think through how I can manage the business to get to those metrics and ratios that I, uh, that I need to achieve to get to my objectives. So thank you for joining us today. I'm going to turn it back over to Tyler to wrap things up. Uh, and any questions, comments, uh, or follow-up that you may have, please feel free to reach out to either David or I uh, as the information, the contact information is there on your screen. Thank you once again for joining us for this presentation produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us for our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn more about our upcoming events by visiting us at www.macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.